and you have different variables. Um, so putting, putting into practice some sort of formal methods for software engineering is quite <coughs> difficult. <coughs> because software engineering is about behavior, it's about human behavior. Um, so the engineering research has a lot more in common with behavioral science than computer science. We're not talking about algorithms. We're not talking about if this, then that, you know, switch case, blah, blah, blah. We're talking about how do, how do human beings work together? How do we approach this problem? Um, how do we approach this problem together? So if you were hoping for like a super hard talk with lots of technical stuff, sorry to disappoint, that just doesn't exist in, in software engineering research, it's not there. Alright, so with those caveats, how do you actually read the research? I want you to have already read research, so this is going to be more interesting. Um, this is roughly how basically all studies ever put together. Um, abstract introduction method results in the The abstract is the too long in three. Um, it's a lot like, and in most cases, equivalent to a conference talk. So if you submit it to a conference ever to do a talk, like this one, you bring up a little blurb that basically says, hey, I have something I think is interesting to say, and I think you should bring me to your conference today. That's the abstract. Um, this is just a screenshot from a PDF of a study that we're going to talk about in a just up there. The abstract covers this stuff on the left. So what did you study? Um, in the case of this previous screenshot, we studied test-driven development. Um, and we studied it because there's really not a lot of, at the, at the time of this study, which was 2008, um, there's not a lot of empirical evidence supporting or refuting test-driven development. There's, there wasn't a lot out there. It was getting super popular. People were starting to use it, but there wasn't a lot of hard data to back up what anybody was doing. Um, so that's why we studied, that's what we studied. We found that TDD is, is pretty cool. It's this thing. That's, what's gonna, that's what you're going to find in pretty much every abstract ever. The introduction in the paper um, is what's supposed to get you, it's, it's supposed to convince you to read the rest of the paper. What are we looking at? What are we observing? What behavior are we looking at? Um, what problem is, exists that we've noticed that we're trying to figure out? Um, why is it interesting? Why do we care that, this, that you observe this or that this problem exists? And specifically, what are, what are you looking for in your study, in this study? Um, the introduction also often includes a survey of related <coughs> works. Uh, prior work, other studies that cover similar topics, um, really anything else that the author thinks would help the reader understand the point, like why, why this is interesting. This is where, this is where the method is where you start seeing lots of tables like this, um, starts getting very, very detailed. And that's because it's describing exactly exactly how the study was set up. <coughs> if it's an experiment, it's going to describe the odors, it's going to describe exactly what your input samples were for the experiment. Um, it could be a case study, it'll describe the groups in the case study, like what you're doing. Um, it could be an analysis of existing source code. This will this actually will talk about the source code itself, different projects, whatever it's looking at. Um, and what in that environment was measured. So, number of defects in source code, um, length of time somebody took to complete a project, uh, reaction time when you're reading uh, source code, that, that kind of thing. Um, so this is this gets very, this gets very, very detailed. Results are the, the raw facts from all the measurements that were taken in the we're describing the um, So again, very, very detailed. Looks more, more tables with lots of measurements. Um, how did the measurements go? What, what, did I, what were the results of those measurements? Um, what might have gotten in the way? Or this section is often under a subheading called Rex to Validity. 
um, things in the study or in the environment or somewhere, somewhere affecting the study that may skew the results in a way that would And the conclusion itself is always the end of the paper. What does it mean? What does all this mean? I know what measurements you took. I know why you took them. I know what the results were. What does that mean? It's important, it's very important to know that when you're reading an academic study, you don't actually have to read the whole thing. Um, this is a common, common mistake that, that I know is common to some people. Are. If you're not a subject matter expert in, in what they're talking about, um, if you don't have training in statistical analysis, which I don't, um, you're, a lot of these papers, you're going to read the method section, you're going to read the results section, and you're going to, it's not going to look like English, like, you're going to have no idea what they're saying. I was reading one this morning. I have a pretty good vocabulary, like, I'm pretty highly educated. I have a pretty good vocabulary. I saw, like, six words in one paragraph that I had never seen before. It's like, all right, I'm just going to skip down to the next section. Um, you don't have to read the sections in order when you're reading an academic paper. Uh, if you're a subject matter expert, you will probably skip the abstract, well you might read the abstract, but you'll skip the introduction because you already know all that material. You'll be super interested in the method, you'll be super interested in the results. If the method and the results sell you, you might read the paper. Um, if you're not a subject matter expert, introduction and conclusion. If, if you're really interested, read the method and the results and see if you can get anything out of it. Uh, but don't feel like you have to understand everything in the paper to get anything out of it, to, to really have read the paper. Um, all of these all these papers we're talking about are peer reviewed, which means they went around to a big group of people who are subject matter experts. And all those people went through a fine tooth comb and checked the methods and checked the results and looked at the math, looked at the statistics, and decided, is this actually valid? Do I buy? Do I buy this? Um, so the peer review means that you can have some faith that what's in there is correct. Um, so with all of that introduction out of the way, we'll actually look at some studies. Anybody have any questions before we go there? Excellent. Okay. So the first study we're going to look at. Who's read this one? This is this is a classic. People talk about this study all the time. Big study with programming groups at Microsoft and Microsoft. Okay. This one was big and exciting. It's from 2008. Abstract. They studied test-driven development because there wasn't any empirical evidence, and they wanted to see if they if they could find it um, for the for the validity of the practice. And they found, yeah, defect density decreased across the board. Um, Initial development time increased, but not by a large margin. And I forgot the one. There's a fantastic graph. Somebody put a link on my, or put a comment on my joint in that's like, jump up, look at the graph next time. Um, there's a fantastic graph that shows you how much time it takes to fix a defect um, against certain points in the project. So if you find the defect early, like in, when you're still in development, when you're doing, when you're in your unit testing, it takes way less time to fix defects at that point than if QA finds it or if you find it after deployment or whatever. Um, it's a great graph to put it next time. Just take my word for it. This is not this is not a significant increase. And because defects take so much longer to fix after um, deployment, it's even less. So there you go, that's the abstract. And really, if you're in a hurry, you're done. Cool, TDD is good, test driven development is excellent. So we're digging into the introduction in this paper. They, they had one team at IBM, three teams at Microsoft, um, varying, varying levels of experience, uh, varying projects, varying languages, all kinds of different things. Um, it's, it was a good, environment for a case study because they had these four very different teams. So if they could find an across the board improvement to software quality from TDD, 
that would that would tell us things about TGD in general because these are not teams that you would expect um, to be able to transfer processes across very easily because there's no Each team, so it's four teams total, um, five to nine people per team, one distributed team, so one per show. Lots of experience levels. Um, one of the teams was the most people with more than 10 years of experience. Excuse me, another of the teams was mostly people with under five years of experience. The projects themselves, um, at IBM it was a driver's project, we were running operating team drivers in Harvard. Uh, the Microsoft teams, it was a Windows team, an MSN team, and a Visual Studio team. So, development team working on those products. Um, so, three different languages, vastly different code base size, 6 to 155,000 lines per code, and existing in a test company 62% to 95%. So here's what they measured after after implementing TDD across all these teams. The IBM drivers team, 39% defect density reduction, where defect density is number of defects per a certain number of lines of code, usually a thousand. The Windows team, 62% reduction. MSN team, 76% reduction. Visual Studio team, 91% reduction. Um, the, interestingly, you look at this and think, oh, well, these teams must have been uh, the most experienced because they had the smallest uh, reduction in defects. Actually, these teams were the least experienced. And, wait, sorry, these teams were the most experienced. This team was the least experienced. And this team saw the biggest defect. So those are the actual measurements themselves. Threats to validity, what could have, what could have caused these results that was not TV? This is going back to human behavior. So oh, thank you so much. All right. So software engineering, behavioral science, right? We're all people, we're all human beings. These developers were introduced to this new process and they're like, hey, this is really cool. This is cool. I like how this makes me feel. I like how this makes the team job. It's great. They were happy. They were motivated. They may have been writing code. Um, the projects developed using TDD might have been easier. This is the problem with key studies. There's no control group. This is, this is not like there's a control group not using TDD doing this project and then there is the experiment group doing TDD, doing the same project. These are not, these are not apples to apples. Um, if you read the full study, which you can do, uh, you'll see that they they tried to go with projects that were similar to previous projects that have been completed, so similar size, similar, similar complexity, um, to get a good comparison. But this is not an apples to apples comparison. And the, the new projects that they used with TDD may have just been easier. And this is what I said. Comparisons with case studies are not perfect just because of the nature of the case study versus a control that's not the environment. Yes? So you said there's no apples to apples comparison. So For this. Right, so the percentages that you gave of less defects, what's that compared to? It's not less defects, it's defect density. Oh. So it's defects per this many lines. Any other questions? Um, so those were the results. <coughs> what does that mean exactly? These, I forgot to say, if it's an italics, it's a direct quote from the paper. TDD seems to work. TDD seems to work across a pretty big spectrum of different environments for software development. It seems to be pretty solid um, without, a, without a major productivity. This is another thing conclusions often do in studies is sort of start making statements about the future. Um, as you keep using TDD, you'll have all these extra test assets because you're doing all this automated testing and it's not like you throw them out as a release. 
So future releases will also have a higher quality because you're still using the framework. Interestingly, the researchers for this particular paper, um, after, the paper after they were done, after the study was over, IBM actually contacted them and said, hey, so funny, funny story, um, we've had some turnover and our team is now like half new people joined after the study and we failed to sell them on TDD so they're not using it. Guess what happened to their defect density? They got everybody back on, and it dropped. Airship control. Yeah, right. Right. You got to take that study and then go back ten years later. And be like, okay, how are we doing? All right. So that was the that's the big Microsoft IBM TDD study. You'll hear a few people talk about it. It's very exciting. Um, this one isn't nearly as well known. I kind of stumbled over it, and I thought it was hilarious. Who uses camel case in naming? Who uses underscores? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you use both of them, yeah. What? Yes, R2, what is this? In naming what? There's a lot that's going on in this study that 
the method section is like 40 pages long or something. It's very, very long. And here's what they found um, in, in different studies. So you get more accurate results using chemical case identifiers, but it takes longer to represent. So accuracy improves, and time and effort also improves, or also increases. Um, the style makes a difference in simple tasks, reading or, or whatever, not necessarily in reading programs. Um, natural language underscores would be better in software camel casing seems to provide better readability, go figure. And expert programmers, it doesn't make a difference. So that's what they measured. It, this is, I'm sort of paraphrasing, well, I'm using their quotes, their quotes are based on the actual numbers. I didn't put the actual numbers in the slide because it's very, very long, but this is, these are quotes from the study. So they took this to mean um, that camel case is going to be a better choice because you might have beginner programmers looking at your stuff and camel casing is better for beginner programmers. Um, on top of that, the huge body of research that already exists for natural language processing doesn't seem to apply to reading source code, which is a really interesting result of this study. It means that all of that stuff that's already been done, we can't draw on any of that. This is all readability for source code is sort of uncharted territory. There's, there's not a lot that's been done empirically for that. Okay, last study. That's kind of um, they're looking at the relationship between cloning and defect proneness. Cloning in this context means duplicating code, copy pasting code, not like cloning an object. I was confused by that when I first started because I thought they were talking about cloning an object. Um, and they're looking at it because copy pasting code, like that's, of course that's bad. We don't do that. That's terrible. Who copy pastes code? That you refactor. That's what you do it. I also want to point out here. The use of this word right here, folklore, this is academia <coughs> looking down his nose at practitioners. <laughs> this is academia being like, yeah, those people, yeah, they just don't know what they're doing. Which is fair, because all of our all of our knowledge is experiential and it's, it's all based on this kind of like best practice stuff. This is how this is a lot of how we have our job. Um, but I just thought that was interesting. This is classic. Anyway, so what they found. Our findings do not support the claim that clones are really a bad smell. This is the opposite of, of current best practice. This is the opposite of you know what the way we try to write our code right now. So let's look at this. Maintenance and evolution are a huge part of overall cost and effort for any software project. It, it's always like you, you know. You do 90% ship, and then you do the other 90%. That's that's this. Martin Fowler, who is uh, one of the big agile development guys, wrote many many papers. Um, one of them suggested that code duplication or cloning is one of the big indicators of code maintainability. So if you the, the hypothesis here is that if you have a lot of duplication, you're going to have bad maintainability, you're going to have bad quality. There's a whole other body of research that suggests the opposite from Martin Fowler and who the next is at all. Um, that suggests that actually duplicating code can be fast and doesn't really decrease the quality of code at all. So this study was looking specifically at bugs and duplicated code and the relationship between them to see if there was anything we could draw from this instead of sort of assuming one or the other. So to set up the environment, this was a code analysis study. So there was no, um, there was no rewriting of code. This was all just, they're looking at existing OSS projects, Apache, Nautilus, Evolution, and GIF. Um, thought it was, I thought the, the gnome bent there was kind of funny. Okay, here, we run the things off. Anyway, um, so here's what they measured. They measured a bunch of stuff in all of these projects. Um, bug to copy-paste-code ratio. 
does buggy, does buggy code have more duplicated code than other code? Um, is duplicated code buggier than non-duplicated code? So they're kind of trying to hit this from all different angles. Um, are scattered clones buggy than co-located clones? So like, if you're copy-pasting code from one file into like a whole bunch of different files, and do bugs that have all the duplicates put in those take more time to fix because all of all Alright. So that's what they're measuring. That's what they're looking at. And again, these are, no, this is not quoting from the study. Most of the bugs they found in those four projects contain hardly any duplicated code at all. It's very small. Um, clone code was, did not have a lot of bugs in it. The more the code was cloned, the lower the observed defect density, which is the opposite of best practice. Um, scattered clones also had a lower defect density. And the high clone ratio, much of the high clone ratio, took less effort. Not as much defect. So this is really, this is really opposite everything I ever learned about Copy-pasting code, yeah. I asked Steve McConnell about this. He agreed with the way this study came out. Yeah? Yeah. I, I, my question was like, we're supposed to have like one line of code that does one thing and that's it, right? And like, but I didn't I didn't agree with that. That's just when I put the question. And he came out with an a very long answer that just said, no, it's okay to put your code here and there. Like, having one thing in one place is, isn't very productive. Interesting. Steve McConnell, so that's the author of code Yes.
Drawing general conclusions from an empirical study is hard because it depends to a large degree on a potentially large number of context variables. There's a lot going into software engineering research. There's a lot going into behavioral science research. There's just a lot. People are very complicated. It's impossible to account for every variable that can go into um, these studies. So we can't assume, we can't assume, we'd like to assume, but we can't assume that the results of a, of a given study apply to everyone in all situations everywhere. So basically, don't go looking. If you start, if you start getting into this, if you start looking at academic research, because you're like, hey, this is interesting, I want to see what people are looking at. Um, don't go looking for universal truths. Don't, don't try to find that. Try to find stuff that matches your environment, or matches an environment that you know about. Um, and start pulling in the results and the conclusions into your processes based on how closely it matches. Or if you're just super interested, you know, take something completely out of the left field and, and throw it in. Like, try just copy pasting on your code. Throw out all of your objects, all of your refactoring, just copy paste everything to another. Where do you find this academic research if you are interested? Okay, and Margaret mentioned this. The vast majority of the stuff is behind the paywall. Um, journals have to make money. So the studies that they publish, you have to pay for it. There are ways around that. Um, these are a couple of the, like the first two here, IEEE and ACM, are major uh, engineering computing associations. They have uh, conferences all over the world, people submit. You can, you can read the proceedings of the conference. A lot of people are going to publish that way. Um, this, this stuff is mostly behind the paywall for those organizations. Uh, Microsoft Research, they just have PDFs of their stuff online. So you can go there and look around and see and just read it right there. You know? okay. First Monday, I, I stumbled over when I was writing a research paper. This is the first, and as far as I know, only open source peer reviewed academic journal online. They have a ton of content. A ton. It's, it's fascinating. There's just so much in it. And because it's the first open source online, blah, 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 the people that submit are really interested in open source software. So there's all this stuff about the Linux kernel and you know, open source projects. <laughs> so if you're interested in that, well, we check out First Monday. Um, if you're just, if you just want to like cast a wide net and be like, who's talking about this particular topic that I think is interesting? Google Scholar is a good source. Um, Springer is the classic. Springer has like all the journals ever. So you go to link.springer.com, type in you know TV, and you'll just get a gazillion studies on on the test of the Again, oh sorry, most of the stuff on Springer is again behind the table. but we're gonna get that. Um, this has started recently. Academia.edu, researchgate.net. Um, these are, I put it in quotes because they're all academics and I think that's cute. Um, these are social networks for researchers, for professors, for people who are publishing these papers. A lot of these people uh, publish their stuff on their own Academia.edu or researchgate sites. So you can go there and get them. Um, I have my name on the paper from a long time ago. This is very exciting. This is how you can start getting around payloads. Um, libraries stock a lot of these journals. So if any of it's not like your local library, go to the college library. Um, they have, they'll have them in print. And you can just go in the back room where they have all the journals and start flipping through pages. It's really cool. If you've never done it, totally recommend it. Take an hour. It's really fun. The other thing you can do, um, Colleges have free access to most of these, most of this paywall stuff. So if you're interested in a topic, you find a paper you, want to, you really want to read, email a professor at your local college and be like, hey, I'm, I'm a software engineer. I'm interested in this topic. Do you think you could, you know, send it to me? Send me a paper. I'm interested. You might be surprised. Like, people, the crossover between academia and practitioners is very rare. So when it happens, people respond, tend to respond pretty well. 
query copy case and maintenance, that's different than copy paste <coughs> and development. They're two totally different things. Well, part of the reason that the current best practice in software engineering is not to copy paste is that when you get into maintenance, when you when you start sending the code, um, if you're if you have a piece of code that's copy pasted in seven seven places, when you have want to change that piece of code, now you have to go change it seven places. So that's why they're talking about maintenance. It's, it's sort of this life cycle of, of the copy code itself. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there a particular software engineering that you're keeping up with? You know what? It's funny you should ask. I realized this, I realized this after the fact. All three of the studies I talked about are from empirical software engineering. Um, I actually didn't mean to take all from that journey. <laughs> but they do, I mean, they do empirical software engineering, you know, it's a good story. Um, but yeah, so I, I apparently like empirical software engineering. There's lots of other ones. Um, I sure believe a lot of stuff, ACM has a lot of stuff, there's gazillions. So, yeah. Are they